Thank you, Dr. Liu. I'll be moderating the summit's first panel, and Dr. Liu will be joining me as panelist. Also on my panel, Mr. Stephen Oaken, founder and chief executive officer of APAC Advisors. Now, our panel focuses on ASEAN's macroeconomic growth outlook and risks. Our world is highly interconnected, and no country can be completely unscathed by unfolding developments in geopolitics. How do we navigate the impact of such geopolitical developments on ASEAN economies. Let's hear from the experts. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me on the first panel of the RHT Kaaba ASEAN Summit. Uh, we certainly can be assured of fresh eyes and ears coming to us online. Uh, for those online, if you have questions for uh, my panel, please do pop them into the chat box. Uh, we will get to them about halfway or so through the next hour, but rest assured, we will get to them. Now, we've heard... Um, a series of speeches and I want to uh, focus in particular first of all on the uh, opening address uh, by RHT Law Asia Chairman Mr. Walter Woon and he obviously uh, mentioned US-China tensions uh, using the analogy of two elephants. Uh, so my first question really is focused on that. Um, to set some context, uh, Steve, uh, how did we get here? Well, you know what, I really want to, to, to build on, on what Dr. Leo said. And, and if, you, if you think about where China's actions have been in the last you know, decade or so, um, China has become much more aggressive um, in its, its foreign policy and its economic policy, and it's become much more repressive uh, at home as well. Um, you know, Dr. Leo mentioned the treatment of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. You, you've, you've seen in, in Hong Kong with the, the national security law and, and how uh, protests have been treated there. And so when, when you take that framework of a much more aggressive approach, and, and certainly the, the decade plus um, of not living up, uh, at least to the spirit, if not to the letter, of international commitments when it comes to doing business in China, having forced technology transfers on those companies doing business in China, um, having an unlevel playing field with uh, state-owned enterprises, not protecting intellectual property. Mm -hmm. That has caused a change from the U.S., but, but also from other governments in how they are dealing with China. And so you've seen the increase in tariffs um, from the United States, started with the Trump administration, has continued on through the Biden administration. And then you've also seen, um, very recently, an increase in the type of restrictions that are going to go into investment into China, especially when it comes to supercomputers and, and, and artificial intelligence and the like. So that's the framework that we're in now. And, and, and what ASEAN has found itself is in a position of saying very clearly and, and repeatedly from Prime Minister Lee in Singapore to other leaders across the region, we don't want to choose. We want to have good relations with the U.S. We want to have good relations with China, both from a diplomatic perspective, from an economic perspective, a trade perspective, an investment perspective. That gives ASEAN a lot of opportunity, and it's taking advantage of that opportunity, but it's also giving ASEAN a lot of challenges. And this tightrope that, that ASEAN and, uh, is walking between the U.S. and China is going to get narrower and narrower and more difficult to balance. Mm. But l let me just bring up the analogy of the elephants again and, and it sort of bring in a historical uh, quote mm. from uh, f the late Prime Minister, um, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, and he said when uh, elephants fight, the grass suffers. Uh, but when elephants make love, the grass also <laughs> suffers. So are we caught between a rock and a hard place? Well, we don't know yet, because if you think about the, the economic framework that's coming forward in ASEAN now, right, you have the, the CPTPP, the, you know, the, the Comprehensive uh, uh, Partnership for in, in the Trans-Pacific, that includes many countries in ASEAN, um, does not include the U.S., doesn't include China. You have the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, includes China, not the U.S. You have the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework that the, that the U.S. has put forth. 
um, that obviously includes the U.S., doesn't include China, mm -hmm. in includes, includes four of the ASEAN countries. So ASEAN is uniquely positioned to take advantage of that competition because it is the only country, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, they're the only countries in all three. So there's real opportunities there. But that doesn't come without the dangers of getting, of getting trampled or squashed, depending on which analogy you want to use. <laughs> Dr. Leo, do you agree with that? Yeah, um, I think first of all, I would like to uh, say one thing is about the Uyghur. In fact, I, I didn't say that as far as uh, China's policy on Uyghur was the concern. Uh, it was what you call against human rights. Uh, but I was talking about the Indonesian views of a Uyghur. Mm -hmm. They considered this, in fact, as a kind of terrorism. Therefore, Indonesians, uh, moderate Muslims, are not very sympathetic to the Uyghur. Okay. But on the other issues of the two big elephants, when they dance, uh, when, when they fight, or when they make, make love, we the suffered. Indeed, I think if this kind of tensions between, in, uh, between China and the United States continue, I'm afraid that we are going to suffer. And then especially, I think as you dimension, when the, in, uh, when the conflict intensify, are we f will we be forced to choose, to take side? As far as ASEAN are concerned, I just ASEAN just do not want to take side because ASEAN countries, you know, have good relation with both countries. We do not want our friends, you know, to fight. And then toward the end, we are going to suffer. So it's a little bit like a high school relationship. So I'll call it a love triangle of mm -hmm. sorts, right? ASEAN, US, China. Uh, so I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Steve, mm -hmm. but um, if you had to choose, if in your personal opinion, uh, in this love triangle, whose hand do you think ASEAN would choose to hold? If you had to choose based on current, uh, the current situation at this point in time. Well, I mean, and, and so far they haven't. I mean, so we know the answer. Yeah, yeah. They haven't yes. chosen. And, and the question is, you know, what actions are the are the main players going to take? What actions are China going to take? What actions are the United States going to take? When when China militarizes the South China Sea, mm -hmm. that has a direct impact on the countries of Southeast Asia, regardless of what the United States does. So th that is one of those actions where, where China has been aggressive to the detriment of, of the countries in Southeast Asia. Um, now, when you have the United States putting on sanctions on, on, on doing investment into China that is going to an, affect firms here in Southeast Asia because they're not going to be able to invest in China if they are violating these U.S. sanctions, then, then that is going to hurt the ability to do business. So, so you're getting pressure from both sides, but you're also getting getting a lot of hopefully carrots from, from both sides. And that's what you're seeing from the United States with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, focusing on how do we make supply chains more resilient? How do we prevent the next pandemic from happening? How do we increase trade flows? So there are things that, that you know, while you have the, 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 the sticks, if you want to say, that are coming from, from, from China and the U.S. at different points, you're getting a lot of carrots, too. And that's why I think it the, the, the ASEAN countries don't want to choose, and they haven't chosen yet. Mm -hmm. And now whether they're going to be able to continue not to choose is, is getting to be more and more it, difficult. It, definitely. But what you're describing, is it like a pipe dream in the sense that um, is there a scenario in which everyone can get along, you know, as some, some sort of symbiotic relationship uh, where all benefits, all partners benefit, or is it a zero-sum game where China's gains in ASEAN mm. corresponds with uh, U.S.'s losses in, in this region. Well, I was, so right now, from an economic perspective, ASEAN is gaining tremendously. You're, you're seeing a shift from investment, and certainly in private capital, from China into Southeast you're Asia. you that's not going to last? Well, no, that, that can last, right? I mean, so you can... So can what scenario, under what situation, what uh, you know, situation would that 
uh, be able to last. So, uh, under the status quo, that has been that has that is currently happening and will continue to last. But there are so many geopolitical risks out there, right? You, you've certainly seen the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Yes. You see China say we have no limits on our partnership. I mean, you see China saying we have no limits on our partnership with Russia, and you see China changing its its language in the Party Congress towards towards Taiwan now. Um, and so, what's going to happen if we get into a conflict from China to Taiwan. That is going to have tremendous impacts in, in Southeast Asia uh, from an economic perspective, potentially a military perspective, a diplomatic perspective. So you have you know, we used to call them black swans. We used to say there's all these black swans that are events that you only see in, in, in hindsight. Well, we don't have black swans. We still have black swans, of course. But we now really need to be focusing on the gray rhino. Right? A gray rhino is a big, ugly problem that's staring you in the face. That's a real possibility. And there are a lot of those gray rhinos out there right now from a geopolitical perspective that all countries need to deal with, and especially in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I beg to differ from you a little bit, Steve. Yeah, I think the, um, as I see it now, this is a bipolar world at least. You know. There are two superpowers. However, as far as the United States is concerned, militarily is much more stronger than China. Perhaps I think it is also uh, one of the purposes. I think that. If China is not contained, quote unquote, you know, at this particular time, then the superpower is going to be you know, only on par, perhaps, uh, will be stronger than the United States. So this is basically, I think, it's a struggle between two superpowers here. But the two superpowers, I think, this this sort of this sort of competition, I think, is very dangerous. We do not want to see that they are going to 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 uh, to have a clash, you know, and we are going to, as we argued earlier, we are going to suffer a lot. However, I think when you look at the uh, what you call the security situation, the example earlier that you gave uh, was uh, the South China Sea issue. Of course, when you talk about South China Sea issue, many Southeast Asian countries who have overlapping claims, for instance, on the territory and the waters, for instance, uh, would not be friendly with China. And, however, when you look at the other situation, the Taiwan issue, now this is a completely different game. Now, many Southeast Asian countries, almost all, I would argue, in fact, consider that the Taiwan issue, in fact, is the domestic issue of China. And then, um, then um, all of the Southeast Asian country admitted that as, as far as uh, Taiwan uh, was concerned, you know, uh, this is what you call part of China. However, now you have a new development here from Ukraine, you know. Now the United States moved move to what you call uh, a Taiwan to make the Taiwan situation very tense, for instance. I do not think that as far as the ASEAN the countries I think, uh, uh, are concerned, they would side with the United States. Because it is not in their interest, I think, to side with the uh, with the United States. I think on the uh, Taiwan issue, mm -hmm. uh, this is, I think, my argument. Therefore, on some issues, for instance, the uh, the ASEAN states would side with the United States, but on other issue, it seems to me they would not uh, do so. My uh, my um, uh, my understanding, I think, is is this that these two superpowers, you know, they have to reflect a little bit. They have to have constraint. They have to have more wiser leadership, I think, in order uh, to make this world a more stable and peaceful world. Steve, right to respond. No, no, I, mean, I think, and that's, that is the, the, the struggle going on, certainly, in the, in the foreign policy debates in, in the United States. And 
the, the, where the Biden administration has taken a different approach towards the Trump administration is that the only way we, the United States, can succeed is working with our friends and like-minded partners and allies um, in a multilateral approach. The approach the Trump administration had was very much a bilateral approach. We are going to put tariffs on Japan. We're going to put tariffs on Singapore. We're going to put tariffs on South Korea, in addition to the tariffs that we put on China, whereas the Biden approach um, has been, let's bring together, you know, like-minded nations, let's bring together our trading partners. And that's why you have 14 countries, um, including, you know, Indonesia, uh, in the Indo-Pacific economic framework that, that weren't in uh, CPTPP, that never had that type of economic engagement with the Trump administration. So that, so the Biden administration recognizes this, um, and they recognize that, that inclusivity is what is going to win the day. It is not going to be a battle between the U.S. In China, um, they certainly hear when Prime Minister <laughs> Lee says, "You know, United States don't make us choose because you may not like the choice." Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you have to have a different approach towards China as it has become more aggressive um, from an economic perspective, a business perspective. Like it's, it's the United Nations that's found that that, that, that crimes against humanity have occurred in, in Xinjiang, um, and so that is going to take. That is going to be a part of, of U.S. foreign policy. Um, and so how do you balance all of this right now? That is why we are in the, uh, such a <coughs> unique and, and in some ways dangerous time, but hopefully an opportunistic time as well. Yeah, can I just bring that up and, and talk about what you just said about earlier about carrots, the, the fact that we are in a good position, status quo is good. Um, but you can see the region building towards uh, a, a, what some people call a crisis of disunity. You know, they don't align on the South China Sea. They didn't seem to align on the Myanmar coup. And of course, uh, when it comes to um, relationships, individual relationships with U.S. and China, uh, some of them, they may not outrightly pick sides, but you know who they're more aligned to. And of course, when it comes to uh, the Russia-Ukraine tensions, um, you can also see maybe a fracture of sorts. Uh, so building that up, how can you then still say status quo is actually good? Well, no, no, okay, so, so a couple of different things to unpack in there. Mm -hmm. All right, look, I mean, a country like Singapore says, it's, there's not Russia-Ukraine China, Russia -Ukraine tensions. Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia violated the sovereignty of, of an independent nation. And a country like Singapore says, this is existential to our existence. So this isn't about tensions between Russia and Ukraine. This is about a war of choice that, that Putin has um, and that the UN and, and his saying, you know, and, and, that, and a country like Singapore sanctions outside of the UN for the first time, you know, in 40, 50 years. Um, so, so that's so that is something that each country is going to have to decide. Um, and look, and but all credit to President Jokowi, who is also trying to find a way with his chairmanship of the G20 to try and solve, you know, the 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 issue that, that resulted from Russia's invasion. And so you can do both things um, at the same time and have credit. But look, ASEAN is not built and hasn't been built, right, to 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 handle crises such as these, because of course, look at Myanmar. I mean, look at the five point. Consensus that hasn't yeah. been that's been sitting, you know, on on some wherever it's sitting, it certainly hasn't been <laughs> implemented in, 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 since it came out. You know, I mean, so so ASEAN's going to have to figure out if it is going to really be a balance between the U.S. and China. It has to be cohesive, and it it hasn't been on core issues like Russia's invasion of Ukraine, like the coup in Myanmar, and all of the deaths that that, that are occurring there. Yeah. Um, again, I think I want to play as devil's <laughs> advocate here. As far as Indonesian views are concerned toward Ukraine and toward the United States, towards uh, NATO, uh, uh, attitudes toward Ukraine were concerned, they have a rather different view. They thought that uh, this was the provocations of the West once the first. Of course, uh, Putin was trapped in. Uh, and then they were talking about what they call the, the real the politics here. What is the core interest of the a major power of the country? Because it is argued that as far as the United States were concerned, it ignores the core interest of other countries. It only concerns with their own 
core interest and continue to expand. Uh, this is one, one view which was put forward rather strongly, in fact, in Indonesia. But what I want to talk about here is when, you, when we mention ASEAN, we always talk about ASEAN yeah, in the lenses of United States and China. I remember that uh, just, uh, I think, in sometime in sep September, I think, this year, uh, Minister Vivian uh, Balakrishnan, I think, in New York, made a speech, you know, I think, about whether or not that we, 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 we drop this, the uh, China, the United States lenses, you know, and just focus on ASEAN. ASEAN centrality, ASEAN in itself, I think, is a unit. Uh, I think, as you uh, mentioned, uh, this is also a very important region, I think, and so forth. And f for the United States, in fact, because it, uh, it moved uh, move ahead much earlier, the, the roots and the economic influence of the United States in this region are much more compared to China. China now is trying to catch up. But if, if, if we are able to do it, I think, in the economic factors here, and we can continue uh, to maintain you know, uh, regional stability, uh, perhaps I think the status quo, I think, uh, perhaps I think is too strong a word. However, I think uh, to mix the region, you know, uh, absence of major conflict, a war especially, even a limited war, I think. Then I think we in, in, in ASEAN, you know, would feel very happy and we would be able to develop the further. I, I, I'm, I, I think that it would be able to maintain the peaceful situation, although it is rather unstable, but the situation can, can be maintained. However, if one side you know, decided to do a certain thing, and especially, uh, I mean, uh, we, I don't know whether or not we, sh we should continue to use the ideological thing. See, using ideology, you know, as a kind of as 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 a kind of what you call a weapon. I think in, this, in terms of uh, human rights, I think, and so forth, because both sides you know, have the black spots. What I, perhaps I think, most of the countries, all of the countries, they are realists. But some countries perhaps wanted to pretend uh, to be an idealist. In fact, uh, the behavior of the country, in fact, is, uh, is uh, belonging to the realist school. You know, perhaps I think we can be more honest, perhaps I think. Look at the situation. Come on, we were against war. We were against this conflict. We were against the escalation of tension. Both sides, I think, please, I mean, try to constrain yourself and think, I think, about this. Because if anything happens, there will be a, a disaster. No one is going to win. Mm. Not the United States, not China. So, so let me challenge uh, this a little bit with um, yeah. a thought that an academic uh, recently uh, suggested. You yeah. know, it was a suggestion for ASEAN to go back to ASEAN 5, the original 5, and they, he calls it the ASEAN 5 plus X, with X being whichever country that they, they form a partnership for, a, you know, whether it's an economic partnership, a political partnership, a security partnership, uh, it could be, it plus X could be a Vietnam or it could be any other country. Um, what, what's your view on whether that's feasible and whether that would make ASEAN more effective? <laughs> You guys are sharing looks, and yeah. I'm not sure what that means. Well, I, when, when I you know I've, I've lived in Singapore for <laughs> two decades now, and, and when I met uh, one of the first ASEAN secretary generals, I met, and you know, and he said to me, when you think about ASEAN, you know, you have to understand, you know, don't think about the European Union. This we are not the EU. Mm. We are ASEAN. We are an association. An association and a union are two very different things. And I think so long as you keep that in mind, that this is an association of countries. It's not a union that comes together, then you don't have any illusions about what, it, what is ASEAN's purpose, what it is going to do from a foreign policy perspective or from an economic perspective. And I don't know that, that ASEAN 
plus five, if it is an association and is not a union, is going to be any different than ASEAN 10, although you, you could certainly make the argument it should be ASEAN 9 right now, whether or not Myanmar should be still be a member of ASEAN, that certainly would be a, an interesting debate. But I don't think that would change anything. Mm. So not like the EU, uh, which brings me to ask this question about the EU's new generation free trade agreement, whether that would work here in ASEAN. You know, the one where they've added chapters on sustainability and social um, elements. Would something like that work here? Well, <laughs> ASEAN, in fact, you know, uh, I think as uh, Steve uh, uh, mentioned it um, very well, in fact, that it was not really aimed at one, uh, to be a union. Mm. However, in the process, ASEAN states wanted to be integrated. Therefore, there is a kind of integrating process, but it is going to be a long, long way. I do not think it's going to be the completed. Now you have, uh, you have ASEAN economic community. This community uh, in names, uh, it already exists. But perhaps in substance, in reality, perhaps, I think it remains to be seen. Mm. However, with this kind of association, I still think that it is very useful in terms of the communications, it, it tried to iron up, you know, the, the difference, and, yeah, to have a dialogue, to. Uh, so, so that they would ha not have a war even between the ASEAN members like the before the establishment of ASEAN. I think, I think it has its uh, merits, although I, I argue it was uh, not very effective at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, it, it, and, and maybe the opportunity for ASEAN, which we, we haven't talked about, is that like, I, I think maybe a bigger crisis facing ASEAN isn't isn't U.S. China, but it, it's the climate cr crisis. Mm -hmm. And and you know, like the Philippines is is one of the countries that is going to be most or is most at risk when it comes to to rising sea levels and and, in, and in increasing storms mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in, in in waves that are that are going to wipe out you know cities and and, and livelihoods and you know. Jakarta is sinking. I mean, Jakarta's, J J Jakarta is sinking um, as we speak. And so what is it that ASEAN can do to come together to address the climate risk? That And, and how is ASEAN going to work on the energy transition when we, we have to go it's some, from, you know, from brown to green in terms of coal to renewables? But that transition is going to be very difficult, and it is not going to be overnight. And so how is all of this going to come together? I mean, can ASEAN come together to focus on, on this? If you don't have a carbon tax that is you know, that, that 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 cuts across borders, then how are you going to be able to 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 manage these these crises? That again, the great rhino, it's in front of us, it's already here, and yet it doesn't seem that 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 there's urgent enough action by the governments. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah on the the climate change on the climate I think, issue, yeah. I think I think it is. Uh, indeed, I think it's quite prob uh, problematic. As I mentioned earlier, it has something to do with the economic stages of development. You know? like, but most of the ASEAN countries, they are developing countries. They cannot afford not to use the, uh, what they call the low price energy. See? If you force them I mean, to get rid of these coals and so forth, how can they survive? <laughs> this is a practical problem, I think. Whether or not that a rich country can come together and help these poor countries, you know, so that they do not suffer much. Mm. Uh, and this, this sort of internationalism has to be uh, cultivated, I think. Mm. And, and that's the, 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 the debate and the challenge we have now on ESG, right, is that, especially when you take the E, you know, the environmental piece, and, and the S, the social piece, there's almost always a trade-off between the E and the S. The more environmentally sustainable you make something, the more likely you're to harm the livelihoods of small shareholder farmers, mm -hmm. miners, the people who rely on the electricity from coal. Yeah. And so 
more environmental, less social. But we don't talk about those type of trade-offs. And, and so, Dr. Lee, you're exactly right. Who's going to pay, right, for the cost of, the, the, of, of becoming more environmental? Because there is a cost to becoming more environmental. And that's something that ASEAN could be approaching and, and working on together, and then being collective when it deals with the EU or the US or, or, or China or, or in, in other multilateral forums. But it doesn't seem to be doing that. Mm, definitely, some have called for socio uh, ecological transformations within the region, right, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, tackle climate change and, of course, to tackle the, the increasing income divide. Um, in light of all that, in light of everything that we've talked about, geopolitical, you know, landscape and, and these challenges ahead, what does this mean for doing business here in this region? Well, I mean, you've got tremendous opportunities, and, and, and businesses are taking advantage of them because you not only have, right, you not only have, you know, U.S. companies and, and Western companies, Japanese companies coming to Southeast Asia because of the economic opportunity. The, you know, you, we used to talk about the BRICS countries, right? It was Brazil, Russia, right, India, China, and if you want to add the S for South Africa. Today, investors, businesses, we talk about the VIP countries. Right, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines. Right, the VIP countries, large populations, a, a huge demographic dividend coming up. So you've got a rising middle class. You both have an export-driven possibilities, but you also have domestic-driven consumption that offers businesses opportunities on areas like services, healthcare, education, financial services, insurance. So much opportunities um, in the VIP countries, and it, it's not just. And so you have that. And then you have the issues in China from both COVID zero um, and and it ongoing, but the aftermath of COVID zero and the U.S. China trade tensions, which are pulling companies and investors, not just Western ones, but Chinese ones out of Hong Kong and China to here. So there's all of that opportunity to be taken advantage of. Of course, we all are paying much more in rent in Singapore, so that's a, a challenge that, that we we, we the, face personally. Um, is uh, is it still relevant for uh, ASEAN and Asia to um, run on the export-led uh, growth model then? Oh, it's not. I mean, I mean, I think that's what you're seeing, all of this investment, right? You're seeing investment coming in. And you know, again, what, what is, what, when you have a rising middle class, when you have an increase in, in, for, for domestic consumption, they're looking for, how do I get better education? Um, how, so it could be tutors, it could be private, private education, and you see that all over Vietnam, Indonesia, right, Malaysia. So you, you, healthcare, people want better access to healthcare. So you see a lot of healthcare investment. You see, you know, where where people say, okay, now that I have a high-paying job, I better get insurance for my car or my motorbike because if that breaks down, I lose my salary. So now that you're going to pay more for insurance, so you have all of these opportunities that that are here today and that is why you see more private capital investment in in Southeast Asia and this equally applies to India than you do in China because this is where the the opportunity is for the next 5 10 20 years mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to start taking questions now and uh, at this point I'd like to also introduce members of uh, RHT Law Asia's uh, ASEAN plus group who will who, uh, who are also joining us online uh, and they will probably be able to take some questions and and contribute to this discussion as well. But uh, meantime, uh, I'd like to pose a question that came in, particularly to you, Steve, uh, where you mentioned the aggression of China. Uh, so the question is, is the U.S. not also aggressive uh, because of the interference in Asia, uh, security arrangements with U.K. and Australia on the nuclear submarine development? Well, I mean, I think that is a, a point where I was... Uh, doing a session with, with my friend, you know, Kishore Mabubani, and I said, China's becoming more aggressive, and he said, Steve, no, they're not. They're becoming more assertive, as you would expect any growing power to be more assertive, as you would expect, uh, and, and that the United States is assertive and what it sees as into it to be its national interest. So certainly, if you would see the, uh, if you want to say that the you know, the nuclear submarine deal between the U.S., the U.K., and Australia is, is an assertive part of U.S. foreign policy. That is, of course, fair. I mean, the U.S. sees this as its way uh, to protect the, you know, the 
you know, naval operations in open seas in, in Asia, and the way to do that is to work with the Australians here. You can certainly call that assertive. I mean, I think the, the question for the countries here is, to what aim is the U.S. being assertive? To what aim is China being assertive? And then to make the judgment for themselves, is it better to align, is it better to support one than the, or the other, or, or do you want to stay neutral? Is there a difference between assertive when it comes to entering into security agreements like the Quad, right, which is the U.S., Japan, India, Australia, like AUKUS, versus China's unilateral actions in the South China Sea? Is that is one assertive, one aggressive? I mean, I think it depends on who's, who's, who's defining it. Mm. Dr. Liu, your thoughts? Yeah, in fact, I think as far as the present situation is concerned, the United States is in Southeast Asia. It will not go away. <laughs> you know, I think we are. We I think we should not be making a, prop, uh, a proposition as if that the United States is going to go away. It's going to be here, I think, for many years to come. You know? So I mean, and 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 this is the present situation. It is very difficult to uh, to change. Therefore, I think the mutual uh, constraints or restraints, I think, I think is important here. Yeah. And then, of course, I mean, because of our, uh, uh, what do you call, different political viewpoints or different uh, stance, we use the terms, you know, differently. Uh, when we talk about others, I, that, that one is aggressive. Yes. Yeah, I, in <laughs> fact, I am not, uh, uh, we, we are assertive. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in fact, both are doing the same thing. What they are concerned about is power, in, influence and power in, in international, I think, relation. I think power is the name of the game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> influence is the name of the game. Yes. So, yeah. uh, a related question um, from Benjamin. What does it mean for China to militarize the South China Sea? And how is it different from the U.S. warships and aircraft carrier fleets sailing through the same waters? Oh, I mean, well, I mean, um, the militarization of the South China Sea is when you, 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 you take what was maybe sandbars, and now all of a sudden you put a military, you build it up, you put a military installation on it, and now you say, this is, this is our territorial waters, and now you extend out, right, and, and say, we can now have ter our territorial waters extend into, into Indonesia. And as Dr. Leo mentioned in his opening presentation, you now have—, have I don't know if you want to use the word conflict, whatever word you want to use over the shipping rights that the Indonesians say, no, this is our water, and that the Chinese say, no, this is our water because we've changed uh, what we consider to be our territory. And so there's a very difference between freedom of, of, of navigation and operations in, in what is considered to be international water and then claiming land and, and, and militarizing an island. When you say there's a difference, you're saying one is aggression and one is... I'm saying under international law, one is illegal, one is not. Having, you know, you are allowed to have your, your, you know, freedom of operations on the high seas when you are in international water. You are not allowed to build islands in what used to be international water for, for military purposes. I mean, that's, that is just basic international law, and that's the difference between, between the two. <laughs> okay, um, we have a we have a live audience on, uh, obviously. Um, I think I have a question from uh, one of our, uh, well, I'd like to uh, pose a question to one of our ASEAN uh, Plus group members who've joined us. Um, it's for Ms. Dang Di uh, Tong V, a partner at uh, RHT Law Vietnam. Um, so I'd like to ask you, with everything that we're talking about, the geopolitical um, conflict uh, uh, between US and China, how have they affected businesses in Vietnam? Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Uh, thanks, Dr. Leo and Stephen. Thanks for your very meaningful sharing today. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is V from Ashila, Vietnam. Uh, my pleasure to join the panel today and discuss and share certain insights about Asian economy. Uh, talking about uh, US-China decoupling and uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine, I, I absolutely agree that uh, their impact continues to uh, reverberate across the Asian country, in, including Vietnam. Now. Like talking about uh, the Russia and U Ukraine conflict, I believe that uh, businesses directly engaged in trade with those countries may feel the most immediate, uh, immediate impact of the conflict. 
from agriculture to manufacturing, energy, to tourism, banking, and of course, we cannot ignore the disruption of shipping and supply chain. For example, let's say uh, in Vietnam, we import from those countries uh, corn fertilizer, certain inputs to produce electronic device. We also export to those countries coffee, pepper, and in Vietnam, we, we are considered one of the most attractive tourism countries for Russian tourists. But uh, because of the conflict, trading has been suspended. And then in, in Vietnam, businesses, we face a shortage of material inputs for manufacturing products already uh, uh, produced in Vietnam cannot be exported to those countries anymore. It, seem, it seems to us that the conflict uh, make more serious the shipping and supply chain crisis. Uh, Vietnam and other the rest of the world, we have been suffering from the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. We see the slowing average shipping time, uh, resulting in a severe shortage of shipping containers worldwide. And more, moreover, many Russian banks have been cut from SWIFT. That is caused many unexpected delay in, in payment. And this is, this is in relation to the Russia-Ukraine conflict on one hand. But, but on, on the other hand, when we, when we talk about um, the U.S.-China decoupling, it seems that things is uh, a little bit opposite. Because it's normally said that um, Vietnam, we, we was one of the beneficiaries of the U.S.-China trade war, uh, U.S.-China decoupling. Because several companies, uh, particularly though, uh, make furniture, refrigerators, car tires, they move production from China to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, we can progressively increase manufacturing, attract more foreign investors, increase the exports to U.S. And 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 a question is uh, why why can Vietnam benefit from the U.S. China decoupling? And I think I think a, a common acceptable reason is that we are very close to China, and along with our location within the Asian regions, then uh, and enterprises manufacturers there can move equipment, sell products across the borders quickly from China to Vietnam and vice versa. And this also helps us to facilitate the trade uh, with our other Asian neighbors as well. Uh. Then, then uh, in fact, I think, I think uh, Asian countries, including my country, Vietnam, we, we all suffer from the impact from the uh, decoupling of U.S.-China conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine. But uh, maybe depending on the uh, geopolitics of each country, then the impact may be different from country to country. Mm -hmm. And this is the issue of um, each Asian member to uh, have um, the most suitable strategy so that they can effectively uh, deal with uh, navy, uh, navigate the risk. So um, just a follow-up question to that. You mentioned all these challenges that uh, Vietnam is facing. So how do the companies there uh, deal with these challenges? Yeah, I think um, for, this, uh, for this one, maybe I would like to share uh, from both commercial perspective and legal perspective as well. Uh, from commercial perspective, there are um, certain things that I saw numerous enterprises here, they are doing such as they, they try to diversify the trade diversify the supply sources, the, uh, the payment system, they try to uh, make use of uh, free trade agreements as well as um, opportunities to cater into the new markets. Um, for example, they, um, instead of um, uh, export uh, products to U European countries, they, they um, export to um, uh, European countries, right, coffee, pepper, because um, in, in those countries, European country, they also need to find alternative supplies to replace for Russian and Ukraine food. And in terms of uh, payment, why Russian banks have been sanctioned, but between Vietnam and Russia, we, we established the uh, bilateral uh, payment channel, for example, via Vietnam Russia Bank, and enterprises can utilize the system for payment as well. They also try to diversify the supply chains in order to uh, mitigate uh, against the court and certain geopolitical risks. 
try to move away from a single country sourcing strategy, identify more alternative suppliers. And in, from, from legal perspective, uh, many clients, many uh, company, they try to have their contracts revealed, especially for, for terms and conditions in relation to shipping, in relation to payment, then they can actively negotiate uh, alternative solutions and avoid unexpected dispute risks. Thank you very much, V. Um, we have uh, another member of the uh, APG uh, with us, uh, Mr. Mohantas Narayanasamy, and uh, I believe you have a question, possibly for one of my panelists. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, hi, everyone. Um, I, I was just trying to basically say that ASEAN is, is, is a great place, and as far as Malaysia is concerned, I mean, it's a wonderful country where we think we've got fantastic relationship with both China and, and, and America. That's that's great. But the narrative that I'm seeing now is basically the, the propaganda war. Uh, and just that when, when you made your, uh, Steve, when you made your opening remarks to say that China is aggressive and repressive, I, I think we should sort of take a little bit of a tone on, on, on that sort of language because I applaud what uh, uh, Dr. Liu was saying about uh, Jokowi, you know, to, to fight back against his narrative because what is very important is that this is a very prosperous region where uh, we, we don't have conflicts with anyone, right? But when you see that, uh, what my concern is, I'm just talking on, on the basis as a citizen of ASEAN, is that when America's sort of what we call approach to, to problems, right? which if you if you want to put it this way ukraine is a very complex problem which was for hundreds of years part of ussr now if you're going to have taiwan basically right been used as an equivalent right right we we just want don't want that to sort of escalate into a situation where we are ukraine there is a war so i would just basically say that there is great for for asean to push back at the same time to basically tell America to be just a little bit non-aggressive because Pelosi's action, the Urkus stuff, is something which is which is really upping the the, the what you call the temperature, and that's the point I wanted to make. But we are a friendly part of the world here, and business can boom. But we now have this dilemma of actually choosing, you know, who we do business with. So I just want collaboration and uh, whether that is possible to have a much more sort of what you call uh, friendly language between the two superpowers. Thank you. Well, I mean, I think that's, that is the, the real challenge right now. The, the, you know, the Biden administration had said, basically, our approach to, to, to China is going to be three Cs. We are going to um, compete with China where there is a level playing field and fair competition. And that is something that Southeast Asia is benefiting from. It's benefiting from that competition, all that investment coming here. The U.S., the leading uh, FDI in, you know, leading FDI into, into Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia increasing more and more trade with China. So, yeah, so you have that, that we're going to compete, and that's where you have uh, a real opportunity for ASEAN. Then the United States says, we are going to confront China where it needs to be confronted. Um, the United States says, we are going to confront China in the South China Sea when they have militarized islands that they said they were never going to do. We are going to confront China when they are, in the United States' word, right, committing a genocide um, in their own country, and we're going to pass laws like the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act that's not going to allow goods into the United States that's, that's, that's you know, manufactured with forced labor. And then the United States says, but we are going to cooperate, where it is in the national interest of the United States and China to cooperate, and that is on the climate, and it's certainly on, on pandemics, if not COVID, hopefully to prevent future pandemics. 
what China has said is we're not going to do that. If you are going to confront us, we aren't going to cooperate with you. Um, and they're canceling meetings that, that, that were scheduled for, for climate cooperation. So we don't know how all of this is going to play out. I think the United States says we can do all three, um, whether China will allow that, and then how the other countries in the region react to that is, is going to be uh, a challenge. And, and that's why this is such a, a tumultuous um, uh, time here. Thank you, Mohan. Thank you very much for Thank that uh, comment you. and the question. And I, I just want to build on that. You know, sure. um, uh, it, it, there was the, it's a friendly region. You were saying, but it's there were still uh, concerns about possibly war even breaking out in the region in Asia. So that's why I think uh, there's a question coming in from Rajan on uh, what. ASEAN can practically do to actually help prevent war erupting in Asia. Um, keep your answers brief because we're just about to wrap up. Um, Dr. Liu, can I get your sense of that? Yeah. Um, as far as ASEANs are concerned, these are kind of, uh, what you call a groups of small and medium state, uh, states. You know, in terms of power, I think well, it cannot be compared with the two superpowers. And the ASEAN rule, I think, is this. I think it wanted to remain neutral, in quotation mark. You know, in fact, the neutrality, in fact, is serving our own uh, regional as well as national interests. And we do not want to have the conflict between these two superpowers, two elephants. And then we continue to say this, and then we are and then in our action, too, we do not want to show that we are really on one side. By doing this, I think if we can gain the respect of the two superpowers, I think we will be able to, uh, to do more. And I think that the super the power would be lucky to have a neutral Asia where there is a kind of buffer uh, between these two major superpowers. And however, uh, as Steve says, that the future in it is still very rocky. You, uh, you, you still have a lot of issues and uh, challenges. I do not know whether or not it can be resolved satisfactorily. Mm -hmm. So uh, just a quick wrap up of what you're saying. Continue speaking, continue talking, gain the respect of the powers. Yeah. Um, any final remarks, uh, Steve? Uh, two. I mean, one, you have deaths occurring in ASEAN right now, and of course that's in Myanmar. I mean, focus on Myanmar. I mean, ASEAN needs to do something. It said it was going to do something, and if you if you can't, you know, have order within ASEAN, what? How are you going to then do it outside of ASEAN? So one is is do what you said you were going to do on Myanmar, and the second is you have to stand up for the international rules-based system. You have to say when the territorial integrity of a country is violated, like it was when Russia invaded Ukraine, you have to call that out. If, it, it, this isn't a matter of neutrality. You, there are rules that have to be followed, and we have to have this international rules-based order. Singapore has been, has been extremely vocal and a leader on that, and I think that is something that ASEAN should be, be doing as well. This isn't a Singapore issue. This is, is about about the international rules-based system that we, we've all had and benefited from and need to maintain. Mm, so speak up. Uh, thank you very much to my two esteemed panelists, uh, Steve and Dr. Liu. And thank you to those who've joined us. Thank you also to the members of the ASEAN Plus uh, group, which joined us and, and gave some valuable insights to the discussion as well. Um, and um, we look forward to more of such discussions throughout the day as well.